Okay, let's do this. So welcome everyone. Today, we are excited to introduce you to our speaker of the day, Gorik Ng. Gorik is the Wall Street Journal bestseller author of The Unspoken Rules, Secrets to Starting Your Career Off Right. Gorik is a career advisor at Harvard, and he's specializing in coaching first-generation low-income students. He's worked in management consulting at Boston Consulting Group and served as an employer engagement specialist at the University of Massachusetts. He was also named as Times Magazine's top 25 future leaders from around the world in 2009 and has been featured in New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, Financial Times. I lost count. There's a whole lot more there. Personally, I know Gorik from high school, and we both started a stock market club back then because we thought we would have flourishing careers in finance back in the day. <laughs> Not the case. <laughs> but today, we're still proud to have Gorik on Brandcast uh, as he shares secrets that, frankly, I wish I knew 10 years ago. So why don't we get started? Gorik, I've had the privilege of reading your book, and what I absolutely love about it is how simple and effective it is um, and the way you've communicated the tips and tricks that are very practical and, and brutally honest, <laughs> to, be, to be real. And, you know, how do you start your career in the right way? And I really wish that I knew this when I started my first job and I was an early professional. But before we get into your book, why don't we get started with telling us a little bit about your story? And, uh, you know, I think it's a really inspiring story. So what made you write the book? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Appreciate that. And thanks so much for having me on, Zara. It's a reunion after a decade and over a decade, and it's long overdue. So what a great excuse this was for us to reunite. I'm glad this has already been a success just from it bringing the two of us together. So thank you for doing this. <laughs> in terms of my story, I'll start from when I was in Toronto with, with you. So I was born and raised in Toronto. I was, and still am, the son of a working class single mother who left school when she was 12 years old. She spent her life working in a sewing machine factory. And I, when I was 14 years old, had to step up when she was laid off from her sewing machine factory job. So at the age of 14, I learned to write my first resume for my mom when she was laid off. I spent recesses learning to write resumes and cover letters, afternoons at the public library looking for jobs, and evenings coaching my mom. Coaching is a generous term. I was mostly just Googling and then passing on <laughs> whatever it was that I was learning. I mention all this because not that I was successful, but because I was unsuccessful. And we applied to hundreds of jobs online, got zero callbacks. And thereafter, I found myself wondering, how could I, as someone who knew how to get onto the internet, who was proficient in English, not be able to navigate the seemingly straightforward process. I'll park that piece of the story off to the side and fast forward a little bit to when I was in high school with you at Mark Garneau Collegiate in Toronto. I met a student at another school by the name of Sandy who had applied to some of America's top universities. And it was through this friendship and mentorship interaction that I learned that there was so much more to applying to some of the world's top schools and what meets the eye. That there's a certain way of writing your essay. There's a certain way of telling your story. There's a certain way of holding your teacher's hands through the admissions process. And from that experience, I was lucky enough to have gotten into Harvard College for my undergrad. And it was through that experience that I realized that there's so much more that's required of us to get ahead than what's written on a website or on an explicit set of directions. Fast forward to high school, rather to university, and Harvard was the first time that I found myself being in such close proximity to this dense of a population of people who could call their parents and siblings and family members doctors, lawyers, senators, CEOs. And it was from this experience that I realized that, wow, there's a whole different world to surviving and thriving and especially thriving in your career. That when I entered the workplace, I started my career off at Boston Consulting Group. I realized that privilege compounds, that 
little choices and little bits of privilege that one has early on in their childhoods leads to privilege in high school, leads to privilege in university, leads to privilege in the workplace. And so when I found myself struggling in my first job, I started realizing that, wow, just as Sandy taught me so much, there's so much that I don't know I don't know, but should know. And that this information is trapped inside the heads of people who have been there, done that, have the mentors, and have accumulated that tacit knowledge that what if I could deconstruct what it takes to be successful in your, in your early career and democratize that knowledge to the world? So that's the, the long story long of where I'm coming from and what brought me here today. That's one heck of a story, Gorik. Uh, I, I gotta say at the age of probably 14, 15, around the same time was the first time I wrote my resume. And I think it was absolutely terrible and um, very similar you know, kind of sentiment there because my parents immigrating into Canada couldn't find a job. So I was trying to get my first job to try and support the family. Um, all that being said, I remember in high school, I wish there were more tools that were given to us to be able to teach us how to be able to handle our resumes and apply for the right jobs. and. To your point, do more than just the resume and be able to go above and beyond and be able to get those little wins and little connections that take us a long way. And I'm so glad you said that, Zara, because I was actually going to start my story by saying, I'm flattered, Zara, that you think I have an extraordinary story, but, and I think extraordinary came from you and never come from me <laughs> because I don't think that I'm alone. And hearing your story helps me appreciate that I really am not alone, that there's so many of us out there. I'd argue that maybe we're the majority minority where it seems like this is an extraordinary story when we're in reality, there's so many of us who are going through this as new immigrants to the US and to Canada, to North America. So it, I'm not special. And I wanna really reinforce that. And that the experience that I document in my book, I hope to be not the memoir that a hotshot CEO would write where no, no reader can really relate to their story. I'd like to think that this is a story for all of us. Absolutely. I think that's a really great way to put it, uh, which is why I think anybody who is actually quite early in their career, maybe you're a new grad, maybe you're a few years in, this book is actually perfect for you because this is not written for CEOs uh, necessarily. I mean, I'm sure they can take advantage of it, but this is written for People like you and I, who are still trying to figure out our careers, who are still trying to figure out how to make the right connections and how to stand out. Um, but let's let's talk about a, a let's let's get back to the basics because right in the beginning of your book, you talk about a very interesting framework, which sort of lives in your entire book in some way, shape, or form, which is around the three C's. Okay, so tell tell our audience, you know, what are the three C's? You know, why are they important? And and specifically talk about some of the unconscious biases that might play a role when we think about the three C's. Sure thing. So the three C's stand for competence, commitment, and compatibility. And the idea is this: whenever you show up as a professional, whether it's on a resume, in a cover letter, in a coffee chat, in an interview in your first day on the job, in your first day meeting with clients, and quite frankly, for the rest of your career, the people around you are going to be sizing you up and will be asking themselves three questions. Question one is, can you do this job well, which is competence? Question two is, are you excited to be here, which is commitment? And question three is, do we get along, which is compatibility? So competence, commitment, compatibility, the three C's. Your job, my job, all of our jobs is to convince the people around us to answer yes to all three questions all the time. And this is important because if you aren't showing competence, people aren't going to trust you with more important responsibilities. If you're not demonstrating commitment, people are going to question whether they should be investing in you and your career. And if you're not demonstrating sufficient compatibility, which may not always be in your control, by the way, and I think that's a nice segue into the unconscious bias piece. If you're not demonstrating sufficient compatibility, then people may not necessarily want to be around you. And so I, I say that in a delicate way because this does in fact get quite touchy because if you don't look like, talk like, or have the same backgrounds or interests as those around you, compatibility isn't always in your control. I mean, you can try your best at small talk, but if your coworkers are talking about 
sports teams and music festivals and hobbies and trips that you can't relate to, there's only so much that the individual can do to establish compatibility, at which point the onus is on leaders to play more of a role. But I'll, I'll, I'll step down from that soapbox for a moment and just sort of talk about how it's interesting how over the course of interviewing over 500 people across different geographies, industries, and job types, as I think about the people who get promoted, it's interesting to see how they've successfully demonstrated all three C's. And when I think about interns who fail to get return offers, entry-level employees who struggle breaking into management ranks, and quite frankly, anyone who feels like their career is stalling, it's interesting to see how the, the micro moment might be specific to the individual and idiosyncratic to their circumstances, but it, so much of what holds people back is a struggle with one or more of these three C's. And so when I think about the, the unconscious biases, yes, there are certain things that we as individuals can do to demonstrate and flex those three C's, but there are also going to be circumstances that prevent different people from getting to the center of that Venn diagram. If you imagine each of the three C's as circles in this Venn diagram and the goal being the, the middle, the intersection. Well, when I think about something like competence, competence is hard to measure unless you're a baker, as I talk about in my book, where all we have to do is taste your cake. But if you're working in teams, working in a white collar environment, where you're working on projects that have a long duration, you have different owners, it's hard to discern how competent you are. What does it even mean to be competent? And so often we're going to be relying on proxies, such as how confident you're delivering a message, how frequently and how articulately you're checking in and delivering your status updates, how polished it sounds like you are. And so polish in and of itself is a nebulous term. So when we start throwing around these terms in the workplace so conveniently, we start conflating confidence for competence. And that becomes problematic really quickly. So there's that piece. And then there's commitment where here we are talking over Zoom during the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, when we were all working in the office, many of us will have probably heard from mentors or parents, if you've had that privilege, that, hey, there's this unspoken rule in the workplace of being the first one in and last one out and always being seen at your desk. And in some working cultures, you're going to have an environment where, well, if Zara is my manager and she comes in at eight, well, I've got to come in at 745. And if she's sending emails at 10 p.m., I better be responding at 10 p.m. And of course, we very quickly creep into the territory of, woo, are we talking about some toxic work culture here? But what is all of that? That's com that's commitment. And then finally, on compatibility, we think of small talk in the workplace, that pre-meeting chit-chat, as being optional. In fact, I have a quote that didn't end, it, end up making it into the book from an individual in an accounting firm, where she said, so many of my Asian friends, this individual is Asian, so many of my Asian friends see small talk as taking a break. Is that to say that I need to be working for eight full hours of the day and be putting my head down? No, until I realized that, or rather this individual said, I used to think that way until I realized that no one gets ahead by putting their head down. And so that speaks to how important it is to be compatible. Sometimes depending on the work culture, it may be even more important that you're compatible than you are committed or, or, or competent. And so Three C's, three letters of the alphabet, or one letter of the alphabet times three becomes, can, can so quickly unravel into so much complexity in our everyday lives. So again, sorry, long, long story long on that one, but uh, easy for me to get fired up on this topic. This is probably the one chapter of your book that I read twice, I have to admit. And the reason I'll say that is, I think it is a very sensitive topic it's also the most controversial topic in your book, I would say, to be very honest. And the reason is, is it's quite subjective in certain instances, right? So some people may actually tell you to your point, small talk is critical 
some other folks in certain other cultures outside of North America may actually say, no, you know, you know, there is no need for small talk. There are certain companies who still encourage, you know, shorter meetings, get to the point, bring an agenda, bring an objective, while other, other organizations are still having hour long meetings where first 15 minutes for catch up. So I think it's very different based on everybody. Here's, here's a question for you though, and specifically on compatibility and specifically when you talk about unconscious biases here, how do you get around, how do you, how do you become more compatible? And this, this is a bit of a heavy question here because I think I'm thinking about people who might come back to you and say, Gorik, I'm an introvert. Gorik, I am a quiet person. Gorik, I work in the background. I don't, I don't have a consumer facing job or customer facing job. How do I build my compatibility, Gorik, in the 30 minute interview that I have with someone? What mm -hmm. are your thoughts? It's tricky. It's tricky. And I'll, I'll answer this. I, I hesitate to answer with, this is the silver bullet and let's fit this into a single soundbite and move on. There's a bit of complexity here. So forgive me as I come at this from different angles where one is around mirroring others, which is one of the unspoken rules in the book, which is also, by the way, a, a rather controversial one because there have been studies that have shown that mirroring the mannerisms of the people around you can help someone come across as more compatible. However, once we start talking about that, then we start getting into, well, to what extent should you conform to fit in? To what extent should we even be talking about fit actually? And to what extent should we be encouraging everyone to be their full authentic selves at work? This is a topic that the corporate world is debating in real time. So I don't, I don't know where this is going to go, but certainly mirroring others is a strategy, whether you choose to, to what extent you choose to embrace that strategy is, is, is a decision on the individual. But I sort of put that out there as one of those unspoken rules, just, just for the purposes of being able to point to it, to say, Hey, here it is, take it or leave it embrace it or challenge it, but here it is. That's one. Another I think about is around asking questions where I have a number of stories that also unfortunately didn't make it into the book of individuals who sat in meetings and saw this rapid fire tennis match between one colleague and another of, oh, did you go see this TV show the other day or go to this restaurant and go on that vacation? And everyone's responding with, yes, me too, me too, me too. And then meanwhile, the individual who can't relate to any of this is just sitting there thinking, okay, when do I join in? And this individual ended up really not participating at all. And as a result, fast forward several weeks was deemed to not be a culture fit. Now, here we start also getting into, well, how much of this is on the individual to become a culture fit and how much of this is on the team to create an environment where everyone can participate. So that's, that's already a debate on its own. But in the case of this individual, what this individual started realizing over time was that, oh, maybe I can't say I as well, or I did this also, but maybe there's an element of simply asking questions and showing interest in other people of, oh, I've never been to Italy before. How was it like? Where'd you go? I'd love to check it out. Or I haven't listened to this band or artist before. What songs would you recommend? And so there are little ways to perhaps make the most of the circumstances. And I'd like to think that this isn't just performative, that hopefully your life will get better as well. If you show an investment in other people, hopefully that'll be reciprocated back to you. And then the last piece is around, well, if it's difficult to convey that compatibility, can you use competence, your competence specifically, to kick the door down? So if you and I, Zero, were colleagues in the workplace and didn't know each other all that well and really couldn't find those areas of commonality that we could small talk about, well, could I at least ask you about your work? Could I ask you about how that project went? Can I express interest in your prior background and ask about how you got to where you are today? Maybe we can start by talking about work. Or, and or, 
maybe I could sign up for a project with you and maybe we could participate together in an employee resource group where maybe you and I don't have all that much to talk about on a social level, but I can start off by saying, hey, Zara, do you mind sending me this email or forwarding me this calendar invitation? And then over time, I can start saying, oh, by the way, how was your weekend? And using that as a way of sparking relationships, which happens to be one of these chapters of really is sparking relationships. It takes one person to show that interest for this relationship to develop. I don't remember now how we met, but I'm, I'm sure it was somewhat similar where we were <laughs> in high school. We bumped into each other in the hallway. I was probably blocking your way as you were walking to your locker. And hey, we, we, some, one of us broke the ice and here we are today, over 10 years later, still maintaining this relationship. It's the same thing for the workplace, I like to think. I, I love the three tips you've given. And I think those are really valid ones, right? So where possible, mirror others, if it makes sense, ask questions to get involved or interested and finding things in common. And th those are often the easy ones. I have a little trick, Gorik, and I'll admit it to you right now, is mm, um, I try and remember people's kids or, pe or pets' names. Okay, and I often write it down. So I think those are those are two things that people love to talk about. So whether it's your pets or kids, and that's just a great icebreaker. Whether it's Monday morning or Friday afternoon, doesn't matter, right? Um, so I I always write their kids and pets names down, and if we have nothing else to talk about, talk about their pets or the kids, and I bet you the conversation just flows from there. What are your thoughts? <laughs> love that, love that, love that. I, I I too have noticed a pattern in in my behavior around. If I'm among folks who are in a different stage of life where they have kids, their kids may even be my age. There's a chance that we're probably not watching the same TV shows, nor are we listening to the same musical artists. So I have a habit of asking about their kids. Oh, what are they studying in university? Or, oh, they're applying to university right now. How's that process going? And... I personally love to learn about other people. So it comes back to this idea of how much of this is performative and how much of this is really just showing an interest in other people. And, you know, I, I didn't write this in the book. It may have been condescending in this way, but I, I do think in, in a way, building relationships at work is no different from how you, Zara, built relationships on the playground. Probably not by pushing the kid off the slide, probably by sharing probably by breaking the ice. So we all have that skill. We all learned it in kindergarten. Somehow over the course of our educational lives and work lives, we maybe have tuned that out or something flipped a switch in our heads where we're no longer able to engage in the way we were able to engage in kindergarten. Time to revive that perhaps. 100%, 100%. I am having so much fun talking to you. I do want to get to the next question, but the only other thing I would add here is uh, you know, one thing that one of my managers told me early in my career is, you know, people hire people and people like to talk to people. It's not about companies and you know, it's you people like to work with good people at the end of the day. So the idea of compatibility comes down to is, to your point, but I get along with you. And I think it's so much more important because anybody can learn the job. You can learn the job with a little bit of training, a little bit of guidance, six months. Yep. Anybody can get good at, good at a job. But would I be able to get along with you with 20 other people on the team? Because at the end of the day, we're all humans. And to your point, some of these little connection points just, just help us you know, feel good in our day and feel energized in our day. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that. I know you wanted to move on, but just one hopefully quick add-on to the idea of getting along. So I've lost count of the number of times I actually rewrote the definition of compatibility. And I don't remember what each of them were, but one of them was, do I like you? I think another one may have been, are we similar? And I, I forget the other ones now, but I landed on, do we get along? Because I, I'd like to think, and I, I truly do believe this, is that compatibility, perhaps not unlike a romantic relationship or a marriage, we're now venturing far off into different territory here, but to what extent do you actually need to find a a true mirror image of yourself versus someone that you can get along with. And getting along with someone, yes, it may be easier to accomplish this goal if you are exactly like the other person. But if you're not like the other person, which is probably going to be the case, there's a higher likelihood of that happening. Getting along can mean just simply 
well, getting along, of being friendly with each other, collaborating effectively, showing an interest in other people. You don't have to be best friends. You don't have to be BFFs. You just need to get along. So I'm, I'm actually quite happy with where I ended up in that definition. And I'm thrilled to hear that you sort of, whether consciously or subconsciously, use the words getting along as well, because it's a lot looser and a lot less rigid than, than what meets the eye. And it's really not as scary, I hope, as how it may be interpreted at first glance. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. That's amazing. Well, let's, let's get into some of the other, other specifics. So at Brandcast Gorek, we have a lot of students or new grads and people who are just figuring out how do you land jobs in this insane market, right? They're figuring out, you know, what does standing out mean today? You know, how do I stand out? And whether it's recruiters or hiring managers or executives at work, you talk a lot about that in your book, right? So why can't, what, you know, share us some, some tips and tricks on how does one go about standing out from the rest? It's a low bar <laughs> uh, where if you're getting a job in that context, if I think back to my own experience looking for a job for my mom, later on, I mean, I made the same mistakes over and over and over again where, oh, I should be applying to a job. Great. What does apply mean? It means going online, uploading a resume and clicking submit. That's what apply means. But I think the first thing to be thinking about as a job seeker in this hyper competitive labor market is that it's not about job. It's not about applying to jobs. It's about hunting for jobs. And there's a subtle difference here where applying is just simply tossing your resume onto a big pile that may or may not ever get looked at. Whereas hunting for jobs is, is reaching out. And of course, reaching out is also something that we often hear about and that gets, gets shared in this really generic way. Here's what I would do step-by-step. Step. I would look for a company that's hiring, whether it's because they're growing, even though they don't have any job openings, you know that they just raised another round of funding or they just acquired another company or, you know, they're in the news all the time. It looks like they're doing well. Then find someone in that organization that leads the team department or the company itself and find an individual who may be able to see you as a younger version of themselves. And then guess their email. Often email accounts are going to be first dot last name or first initial last name at company.com, whatever it happens to be, and send them a custom note. And that custom note is really a Mad Libs exercise. If you remember that from elementary, middle school, where it's a bunch of fill in the blanks that are customizable, but that the template is of a certain sort. So I'm going to make this up off the top of my head, but it's hi, Zira, comma, next paragraph. My name is Gorik Ng, and I am, like you, a graduate of the University of Waterloo, majoring in computer science. Like you, I grew up in in Thorncliffe Park, Toronto, and studied biomedical uh, engineering, computer science, because I was interested in A, B, and C. As I think about what I'd like to do next, I'd love to be able to follow in your footsteps and take this experience, which I've mostly had in the lab, and translate it into a corporate environment. Would you happen to have a few minutes over the coming days to chat further about your career? My availability is as follows, all times, Eastern time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I've attached a copy of my resume to this email. Looking forward to hearing from you, Gorik Ng. So that's one example of reaching out and networking, which is on its own, a rather scary concept. Another option is if you feel like, hmm, I'm at the stage of my job search where I really don't have time to just talk to people. And quite frankly, Zara probably doesn't have time to just chit chat with me. Could you take a more aggressive approach and say, hi, Zara, I noticed that you recently raised a new round of funding. Congratulations. I have been following your progress as a company for some time and am interested in contributing to your team, especially in a marketing context. Over the last few summers, I've interned with this startup, this startup, this startup, where I've developed these marketing plans, which you can see in these hyperlinks. I'd love to be able to bring this to your company. And oh, by the way, just a couple of ideas off the top of my head. I'd love for us to do A, B, and C. 
I've attached a copy of my resume to this email. Here's my portfolio. Let me know if there's a chance for me to join your team. I'd love to work with you. Looking forward to hearing from you, Gorik. Again, totally made that up. You'll have to totally wordsmith that, you know, change the grammar, correct the grammar. But notice what I did there, right? I wrote an email that is completely customized to you. And that if we bring it back to the three C's is flexing my competence, my commitment and my compatibility. So I'm starting the email off with like you, and I try to do that as much as possible. I then talk about how I've done all this research into what you do so that I couldn't have sent this email to anyone else. This email is, if I had accidentally sent this to someone else, it would not make sense to that person. That's the litmus test for what makes a good email. And I'd like to think that that email to you would pass that test. And then finally, doing all this research also in turn shows your competence and your commitment because you're showing your competence by saying, hey, I've done all this research. And oh, by the way, I have a background that can help you achieve your goals. And in having done this research, I'm showing that I've gone above and beyond and I'm not sending the same email to a hundred other people, even though you may be, but you're customizing each email such that it looks as if you've really done your homework and you really have. So that's what I would do in this, in this labor market. Don't just wait for a job posting to be posted online. Go look for the job that shows up at the intersection of what you want and what you're most qualified for slash have the best chance of getting. That's actually a really good tip, Gorik. And the, the like you portion is so important. And I don't think a lot of people realize how important it is to be able to connect with the individual, even if it's on an email, it doesn't matter. But having those common points where you said we went to the same school or, you know, I lived in the same neighborhood or like you, maybe we've done the same programs or same university or whatever that is. I always encourage people to go and do homework on the people they're sending an email to and or your recruiters or hiring managers you're interviewing with. Do your homework because go and you know, creep at their LinkedIn if you need to. Go and Google them up. It's okay, do the homework because they are available online now. It's all free information. Uh, you know, it's all public information in many instances. And the reason is, is if you're able to find that the like you moment to your point, it just makes it so much more powerful because now they start seeing themselves in you. They maybe start being a little bit more, a uh, little bit more uh, open to the conversation than they would be if there was a complete stranger who it looks like is just copy pasting every note, right? Right, hundred percent, hundred percent. Well put. That's that's really amazing, and I really like how you were able to make up that email on the spot. So I'm glad we're recording this because uh, I hope everybody's taking notes and able to write that one that one down. I think that that's a really good structure, to be honest. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about. Um, you know, specifically about the idea of influencers. And I'll be very honest, this is something that's quite, uh, so probably in the last 12 months since this idea came, came to me uh, through some of my leaders, and the idea of finding influencers. And you specifically talk about it in your book, um, in the chapter where you talk about, you know, reading between the people and, and identifying your own influencers. So tell me, you know, what do you mean by the influencers? What sort of impact do you think they can have on your career and why is it important? Why should we, we be looking out for our influencers? It's because the most important people aren't necessarily the people at the top. And there's a difference between authority and influence where when we think of the most powerful people, we think of the CEO and that, that's true. That person can call the shots more so than anyone else in the organization. But when it comes to getting things done on a daily basis, the most influential people aren't necessarily the people who have the fanciest job titles. They are the people who know about a certain topic, people that are experts. They're the people who know the most people and are respected by the most people, the socialites. They're the people who, whose opinion matters to those who matter, these advisors. They're the people who because of their position in the organization, let's say they're an executive assistant, they're the gatekeepers in the organization. And so, or they are the veterans, the people who have been in the organization for the longest, where they know what's worked, they know what's been attempted, and they can tell you a lot about how to frame things, what to pitch and not to pitch. And so no one's gonna walk around 
the workplace with this on their name tag or on their foreheads, it's really your responsibility to seek these people out on your first day, week, month, year, because knowing these people can be the difference between getting your ideas adopted and not, and or being able to integrate into the organization and not. And so these five types of influencers are important to keep in mind no matter where you are. And just to recap, it's advisors, veterans, gatekeepers, socialites, and advisors. By repeated advisors, it's gatekeepers, veterans, experts, socialites, and advisors. And so keeping these people in mind is, is super important. Another thing to keep in mind outside of influencers is on swim lanes, who's in charge of what and when. So there's this unspoken song and dance in the workplace of stepping up without overstepping. And there's a delicate balance there as well. And that relates to interpersonal dynamics because it's not necessarily the most competent people who get promoted. It's the people who, back to our conversation, who get along with people and have allies around the table such that the first time you deliver something in a presentation isn't the first time anyone's heard about it. It's the first time the meeting has been convened. But when you look around the table, you've already got everyone signing off on this idea, it just takes that rubber stamp in the meeting versus you showing up in that meeting and presenting something for the first time to a group of people that may not be on your side yet. And if they are on your side, that they might feel sidelined or surprised if you haven't yet run ideas by them. So, so much of this is not in your job description. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you. And uh, you're right, it's not in the job description. And we don't think about the five, these five sort of experts, advisors, socialites, and gatekeepers and veterans. We, we just don't think about it like that. You know, we might think, okay, well, influencer, to your point, is the CEO or the head of, you know, head of the, the department, or maybe even my manager in some instances, but that's it. Now that's how far we think. So that's that's amazing, Corey. Um, I got two last questions for you. And the, the one that the second last one is, what I found really interesting in your preface of the book is you specifically say, you know, don't worry about reading this cover to cover. There's a lot of strategies and tactics and you can kind of go to, you know, the section that interests you and kind of dig, dig into that a little bit more. Uh, so tell me what is your favorite strategy in your book? What is it that you think if there was one message that anybody was going to take away from your book, what is that one message that you want them to take away? It would be take ownership. And ownership was something that I found in my performance evaluation and never understood because no one ever defined it to me. <laughs> what is ownership? It is to think like an owner. What does it mean to think like an owner? We've actually all done it before. So it is treating a situation as if there's no one else to go to for help and the buck stops with you. So if I think about, let's say, taking a bus from one side of town to another, what does that take? Well, I need to go on Google Maps and figure out how long it's going to take from, from point A to point B. I need to make sure that my phone is charged so that I make it all the way there. I need to make sure that I've got money in my pocket. And actually, I've got, let's say, the bus fare, the amount that I need to put in to ride the bus. In COVID times, I need a mask. I need to wear a jacket if it's cold outside. I need to bring an umbrella if it's raining outside or it might rain outside. What is that all doing? Well, all of that is you thinking like an owner, like, hey, I own this situation. So I'm not relying on Zara, who I'm seeing across town, to tell me to bring an umbrella. I, I'm going to bring an umbrella. I'm going to make the decision for myself. And I'm going to think multiple steps ahead and map out everything that stands between me and showing up at Zara's doorstep and owning all of that. Now, we've all done this, whether it's getting on a plane, getting a house, getting an apartment, signing up for classes, we've all taken ownership in our lives before. And it's that mindset that's required in the workplace as well to get ahead, where if Zara gives me an assignment, Zara may be too busy to tell me that I need to be thinking about all these different things. All Zero may say on occasion is, hey, can you look into this? Or, hey, can you handle this? 
in which case for Gorick coming straight out of school, I was, I had spent 16 years of my life passively waiting for instructions and assignments to be given to me. And when an assignment was given to me, I could be sure that the instructions were laid out clearly, that if this is a multiple choice, that the options are A, B, C, D, and E, that the deadline is an hour from now, that's when I need to hand in this test. So everything is well laid out for you. However, in the workplace, none of this often is laid out to you. In which case, what separates top performers from mediocre performers are the people who are able to unlearn what we were taught in school and relearn what we learned in life of, oh, wow, I actually have to figure all these things out on my own. And if Zara doesn't tell me, it may be because she forgot to, she forgot to tell me or because it didn't occur to her, in which case I need to be the one to go to Zara and say, hey, by the way, have we thought about this, this, and this? And, and actually, as I think about this more, I know you asked for this, but given our goal of this, maybe this makes more sense. What do you think? Big difference between these top performers and mediocre performers simply ha by having this ownership mindset. Oh, Gorik, you're saying, you're saying exactly what sometimes we as leaders are hoping for. Uh, and to your point, sometimes we just either don't have time and or we don't, just don't think about it that far. Of we need to give a set of instructions uh, and you know we don't help our teams understand that they need to step it up. We just expect that they're gonna know what to do, right? We don't, we don't give them the opportunity for ownership sometimes and or we just don't give them enough guidance. Um, but to your point, as individuals who are trying to be best performers or top performers, they can actually take the initiative and they can try and ask the right questions and they can try and understand what's on their manager's minds uh, or their ask or what's behind their ask sometimes that they're trying to understand what's the context. There's so much going on here, Gorik. I think this is, this is, this is pure gold, okay? So here's, here's one last question for you for me. I'm a leader, I'm a people leader. There's a lot of leaders who might be watching this, okay? The conversations you've had in this book are not easy ones to have with our teams for many reasons. It might be taken the wrong way, it might be subjective, it might be uh, seen as, you know, that is the way of the company or the manager, and it may not come across the right way. What are your tips for leaders on how we can help our team understand the unspoken rules? Yeah, I will answer this in a self-serving way and hopefully a more not altruistic necessarily, but maybe a less self-serving way. So the, the, the self-serving way is to consider giving my book to your team. Um, one of the subtitles I had actually toyed around with was what your manager wants to tell you, but forgot to tell you, or is too awkward to tell you. That's a too long of a subtitle, obviously. But part of the reason why I wrote this book was to help managers articulate what they may be thinking, but don't have the vocabulary to articulate or find it too awkward to articulate. So I, I think of this book almost as a manager translation tool of putting in the collective wisdom of all these different leaders and outputting something in this Google Translate tool into, hey, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, keep these in mind and be aware of this. So if you find it maybe too inconvenient, too burdensome to have some of these conversations, well, I'd like to think that you don't have to be the one to tell your team. I can be the one to tell your team. <laughs> that said, of course, there's a surrounding conversation around the book, which isn't, in which case, it's not sufficient to just toss it over the fence. It's to say, hey, there's so much that I had to learn through trial and error and that I wish someone could have told me earlier. Here's all of that in a concise package that's accessible. So anyways, that's the, that's the, the self-serving option is to, hey, there's a Google Translate. I've done the Google Translating. Pick it up so you don't have to spend so much time on this. The less self-serving approach is, especially if you're managing early career professionals, is to leave nothing ambiguous, which is one of these tools I have in the book tailored to 
the individual, but it's just as applicable to leaders where what may seem like common sense to you may not necessarily be common sense to the people you manage. What is implied may not actually be received. And what you know may not be what your team knows. So if, for example, a higher up is delegating a project to you and you're delegating in turn this project to someone else, there's a lot that's lost in translation. So really taking the time to explain what I call in the book, the why, what, how, by when is critical. So why are we trying to do this in the first place? Don't assume that people know. What are you expecting? What deliverable? What does it look like? What does it sound like? Articulate that. How do you want it done? Do you want the people you manage to, to figure it out on their own? Do you want them to follow a template? Have you already done the work? In which case you just want them to update some numbers? Let them know the how. And then finally, the by when, where if you really do need it by 9 a.m. the next morning and you would rather not receive it at 8.59 a.m. and would rather have it at 4 p.m. tonight, say that too, because I'm now having some flashbacks to moments where the why, what, how, by when weren't articulated and I did the wrong work, did it the wrong way, or didn't do it on time. And all of this could have been prevented had what was implied become what was actually spoken. And it could be something as simple as, hey, do you have the login to this database that you're supposed to pull this data from? If not, let me give you the login. Or I don't think I shared the latest file with you. Let me do that. I don't think any of this would ever show up in a CEO management book because it's so granular, but it's these little things that can lead to misunderstandings in the workplace and one person getting ahead and another person not. Incredibly powerful, Gorik, and I completely agree with you, 100% agree with you. Well, thank you so much. I know we're out of time. Um, I do want to say I genuinely, truly think some of the, not some, many of the tips and tricks in the books are very, very helpful, not only for the individuals who are early professionals, but, but as leaders, to be very honest. Um, because I think we are all trying to work towards our own careers, but we also need to bring our teams along. And I think some of these tips are good reminders of what our team is feeling and, you know, what they're looking out for and how we need to think about them, not only about ourselves. So I think it works both ways. Uh, I'll take a quick second and summarize some of the things we talked about. So uh, Gorik had some amazing tips to share. He talked about the power of three C's. So competence, commitment, and compatibility. And the idea is whenever you're showing up, wherever you're showing up, there are people around you who are always sizing you up. So make sure you're thinking about, you know, can you do your job well, which is all around competence? Are you excited to be here, which is around commitment? And are you going to get along, which is all around compatibility? And in a perfect world, you're hitting all three in order to really land that job, in order to really land the project, no matter what you're working on. You have to show your three C's and how you're meeting that. What about standing out? If you're applying for jobs right now, forget applying, go and hunt for jobs. That's what Gorik is telling you. Go and reach out. Even if the company is not hiring, find people in the company who, who, are, who are possibly getting new funding for the teams or who are possibly gonna be posting jobs in the future and find things that are in common with them. Go and guess their email, send them a custom note. Go and be proactive, go and reach out rather than just applying via an easy apply on one of their websites. Do the hard work because that is how you stand out. If you are employed, find influencers in your company. These are the people who are not necessarily at the top, but they have other expertise. So they might be experts at what they do. They might be people who are the most well-respected in the organization because they have all of these connections and they're the socialites. It might be the advisors in the company or the gatekeepers or the veterans. There's a whole lot of them around you. So build your influencer list because that is what's going to help you get to the right people with the right, who have the right influence that can help accelerate your career. And for leaders, if you really don't know how to have some of these conversations with your people, it's okay. I, I am one of them and this book has really helped me. So the first thing I'd say is if you can, Go and give Gorik's book to your team because that's a great way to start the conversation. Let them read it. And then it might open up the door to actually have an honest, transparent conversation. 
But the second important tip is leave nothing ambiguous. What makes sense to you, what you have gained after 10, 12, 20 years of experience may not be obvious to your team. So have the conversations. Do not leave anything as here's, an, here's what I'm implying and assume that they get it. Talk about the what, how, why, when. Make sure you're very clear with your asks and clear with your expectations. But if there's one message Gorik wants you to take away is take ownership. If you are an individual who's not only reading this book, but you're an early professional who's trying to go grow in their career, think like an owner. Treat the situation as if there's no one else there trying to help you or no one else there who's going to protect you. Be responsible for it. Own the process, own the consequences. We had an amazing time listening to you, I'm sure, Greg, and I've had a great, great, great time talking to you. I really wish you all the best. I think this is an absolute, this is, this is amazing. And I'm gonna make sure my team gets a copy of this, but phenomenal work. And I really congratulate you on your efforts on talking to so many people, gathering such great insights and being able to put it in such a simple and effective format. Huge congratulations. And I really appreciate you talking to me. Thank you so much, Zara. That was a remarkable summary. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I am hoping uh, for every, all the brand casters, we're going to post a few different messages on LinkedIn and hopefully uh, we're able to summarize some of these important chapters. Uh, hopefully you get a chance to read the full book uh, and go and buy the book. But it's important if you want a brief summary, we'll share out a few learnings. Um, Gorik, where can everybody follow you? Give them some instructions. Are you on LinkedIn, Twitter? Where, where's the best way to follow you? Yep, I'm on the, I would say, all of the social media platforms <laughs> at this point. So find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. The best way to get in touch is through my website, which is goric.com. That's G-O-R-I-C-K dot C-O-M. You'll find all my social media handles there. And I would say I'm most active on LinkedIn. So feel free to follow me or add me as a connection. And over the coming weeks and months, I'll be starting an email newsletter. So if you're interested in joining that, go on to gorek.com and subscribe. You can also download the first 25 pages of my book if you give your email. So if you're interested in taking a sneak peek at the three C's framework and the 20 unspoken rules in the book, enter in your email, download it, check it out and decide for yourself if this is a book that would be helpful to you. I hope it will be. Sounds amazing, Gorik. We are going to link all of his social media, specifically the LinkedIn and his website as part of the video. Uh, so do check it out. But thank you so much for joining us today, Brandcasters. Hope this really helped you. Thank Thanks, you so Gorik. Much.